Hello, my name is Emanuele, and I'm a volunteer with the Statistics Without Borders. I'm a statistician, and I currently work as a data scientist. Today, I'll be talking to you about one of the lessons within the Statistical Computing module. I'll be talking to you about survival analysis and how to apply it on R, how to deal with it using the, so the statistical software R. So just to recap a little bit, because I know you've seen the theory about this, survival analysis lets you analyze the rates of occurrence of events over time without assuming that the rates are constant. So what survival analysis lets you do, it's modeling time until an event occurs. Compare the time to event between different groups. So if you want to compare, for example, age groups, sex, uh, different sex groups, does it have uh, a difference when I see the event that I'm interested at or not? We can also assess how time to event correlates with quantitative variables. So for example, we can we can do these types of analysis to understand the time uh, required from surgery, not required, but the time from surgery to death, the time uh, from start of treatment to cancer progression, time from HIV infection to development of AIDS, time to heart attack, time to one onset of substance abuse, time to initiation of sexual activity, time to machine malfunction, time to something, some game, some machine to crash. So these are some of the examples that you can, uh, uh, of some analysis that you can do when working with survival analysis. So just again to recap some of the definitions before we actually go into the software to program and see how we deal with that uh, with real uh, data. So we have something called hazard that is the instantaneous event or death rate at a particular time point T. I'm saying also death because this technique is very common within the medical world. So a lot of times it does represent death. So survival analysis does not assume the hazard to be constant uh, to be constant over time. So the event rate does not need to be constant over time. Uh, and the cumulative hazard is the total hazard experienced up to time t. And we have as well what we call the survival function. And that is the probability of an individual surviving or the probability that the event of interest does not occur up to and including time t. So pretty much the survival function gives you the probability of the event that, uh, that hasn't occurred yet. And you can write the survival function as an S of t, because t represents the time, it's going to be the probability of big T greater than t, so really that the event of interest uh, did not occur up to and including time t. So continue with the definitions, another very important uh, definition that we need to remember is Kaplan sorry, this where T is the time of death here. So Kaplan-Meier, Kaplan-Meier is the curve that it's going to illustrate the entire survival function. So the Kaplan-Meier, what it does, it estimates the survival function you're seeing here. So that's why if you see here on the chart, I'm later calling it S hat of T, because that's how we represent estimates in statistics, we had this hat. And the kaplan is a step function that illustrates the cumulative survival probability over time. You're going to understand why it's called a step function later, because I have uh, the plot of a Kaplan-Meier, and we'll help you understand. So once we see that, 
we're gonna get back to this name uh, but just to start mentioning it is step function because you're gonna see it as step so for example I'm here and then the event happened so my probability my uh, survival function kind of declines and then the time continues and then another event another event so that's why a step looks like a step every time uh, an event happens so this is how we estimate the survival function it has this uh, the product of 1 minus d where d is the number of subjects that died or that experienced the event of interest at that particular time ti so you can see here that we always have i so at a particular time and n is the number of subjects that were at risk at that particular time so we know that at time zero the survival probability is one so sdt zero is one and why is that because at time zero the event hasn't happened so everyone is alive and we have all these subjects there and so uh, the this probability it, it never it, it's cumulative so it's gonna keep going down you're never gonna have the Kaplan Meyer going up always goes down uh, another thing that we need to remember eh, before starting with the software is censoring what is censoring? Censoring is a type of missing data that is unique to survival analysis. So we do have missing data in all kinds of problems that we're going to deal with, but censoring is unique to survival analysis, unique to this world here. So censoring, it occurs when you track the sample the subject through the end of the study and the event never occurs. So by the end of the study period, of this fixed study period, no event happened. So we can see here on this chart that I'm presenting on the right side of the slide, we have the subject seven and six so it's the, the first one here is 10 is on descending order uh, so we have that the subject 10 and 6 you can see here the line representing the end of study at 10 years and you can see that the subjects uh, it continue but we never it, it never happened the event never happened up to the end of this study even if it does happen later so in this chart it happens at I don't know, 12 years, I'm going to assume that this is what it's representing here on the chart, 12 years, it's anything over 10, but it doesn't matter because it didn't happen up to the end of the study, so I am censoring that information. So censoring could also happen due to the sample or subject dropping out of these studies for reasons that are other than death or for reasons that are other than the uh, event of interest. So the person withdraw from study. So in this case here, if I am studying death and the person, uh, I'm studying, I don't know, death by uh, cancer, some type of cancer. The person died because, I don't know, they were hit by a car <laughs> or the person just moved out of state and then I cannot get in touch with them anymore then I'm gonna censor that subject because they are withdrawing for study and it's not due to the event of interest to uh, anything else and uh, it could also happen due to laws of follow-up that's what happens if someone moves and then they don't let you know they just go I don't know they just goes to you're there you cannot follow up with them so you can just censoring that information because there's no follow-up you don't know just censor so you can see here that in this chart only three subjects had the event of interest all the other ones uh, had it censored the result was censored so if the sample is censored you only know that the individual survived up to the laws of follow-up but you don't know anything about a survival after that so you lost so for example subject five <coughs> sorry we were in contact with them up to i don't know three years 
but then I lost the contact with that person. They might have uh, had the event that I'm interested in, but as I don't know anything about, I'm not in contact with that person anymore. I don't know, so that information is censored. So censor is, I could not up to that point, but who knows? And uh, those cases that I'm mentioning here are what we call right censoring. So you can see from the chart as well that uh, so the everyone is starting at zero. So all my 10 subjects are starting at the same time and I am sense and, and it's right censoring because I'm censoring at the end of the experiment or, or not at the end, uh, at the end of follow up, for example, right? So I'm always censoring the end part or the start, for example. So we can have what is called left censoring and interval censoring as well. And there are methods that exist to analyze this type of data. But this training here, the examples, everything I'm going to be talking here today is limited to right censoring. That's, that is the most common one. So now that we've recapped and remember some of these very important definitions that we are going to keep using from now on, we can actually start on how to do survival analysis in R. So the packages that we are going to use for this example are survival. That is the, it has the core functions for this type of analysis. Everything we need to do survival analysis in R are going to be available in this library. And this library, the best part is that it's part of the standard R packages, so it's part of base R. So you don't need to install packages before using it. It's already there for you. The other library we are going to use is Dippler because it helps us with data manipulation. It's a part of one of the tidyverse uh, universe of libraries. And the other library we're going to use is serve minor. I know I said all the verb, all the functions we need for survival analysis are already in the survival function on survival library, which is true. But serve minors give us better visualization for Kaplan-Meier plots, and we want nice charts, right? So that's why I'm using those three libraries. And for this example, I'm going to use the data set lung that is available within the survival package. So by loading the survival package, you're going to have access to the long data set. So you can see here on my example that I am uh, loading uh, all the three libraries that I'm going to use. And I'm also showing you the head. So the first three observations of the long data set, just so we can start seeing uh, how many columns we have, how do they look like. So we can see that we have two, four, six, eight, ten variables. Uh, the time is going to be very important for us because this is all about uh, time to event analysis. We have status, we have age, sex, so a lot of variables that we can even uh, see the difference between groups and uh, other variables there. So. Uh, WT laws that if we want to know what each of these variables mean, we can always go to the help of lung. You can put a question mark lung and it's going to describe everything that's there for you. But uh, you can do that. That's what I've done to write this uh, next slide for you. Or uh, so all the definitions of the variables are here for you already without you having to go do that. But it's always nice to know how to look for those definitions when you are in R. So we can look at the dimension of this data set by using the function dim from base R. So you can just do dim and then put the data set uh, within the bracket. So you, you want to check the dimension of that long data set. Uh, the first variable that's gonna, uh, the first value that gives back to you, so you can see it's an array, it has two numbers. The first one represents the row, so we have 228 rows, and the second value represents the number of columns, so we have 10 columns, which we saw here by counting them already. 
So you saw that we have WTA laws, MioCal, a lot of things. So let's actually see what each of these columns represent. We have INST, that represent the institution code time, is the survival time in days. Uh, the status is if you're censoring or dead, so that is the event of interest. Age is the age in years for that particular subject. Sex is male or female, represented by one and two. We have this pH ECOG, that is ECOG performs from zero, that is good, five, you're dead. <laughs> pH Carno, it's Karnofsky performance rated by physician. And we have the PET Carno, that is the same performance, but now rated by the patient itself. Uh, meal Cal is the calories consumed at meals. And WT loss is the weight loss in the last six uh, months. And so uh, with this, we can have, uh, with the glimpse function, we can also have an idea of how the variables look like and what type they are. So you can see here that all the variables were read as numerical. That's why it says DBL, that means double. But clearly, we know that that is wrong because, for example, uh, sex and status, they are factors, right? It's either one or two. Sex is either one or two as well. So they should not be numeric. They should be as factors. Uh, but this is how the data came in to us uh, naturally. So uh, the first thing that it would be interest for us to check is the distribution of follow-up time. So we can that pretty much means, okay, I want to see the time to survive, that is the time variable, survive time in days, this is what I'm calling follow-up time, uh, by the status, so is there a difference in the time that people are surviving in days per censored or dead? Uh, so, uh, because censored subjects, even though we don't know what happened to them up to that point, they still provide information, so they need to be appropriately included in the analysis. And uh, we can see here the distribution of follow-up times is skewed, and they might differ between sensor patients and those with events. So, uh, and the follow-up times is always going to be positive. You don't have people, I don't know, surviving minus one day, right? Uh, I don't know what that would mean. <laughs> Maybe someone died and come back from the dead. I don't know. But follow-up times is always positive, and that is something that you can check when, I don't know, seeing the quality of your data. That would be something you would probably clean and remove from your data. So this is the function that I'm using to generate this chart. So I'm using a ggplot chart. I said I was going to load only those three libraries, the Dippler, but I'm also going to use ggplot. So please load that library before uh, trying to run this function or you will, you will have a error on your code. If you don't have ggplot installed, you need to do install.package ggplot2. That's the name you need when installing this library. So when doing a chart with ggplot, you need to give the data set, so lung, and then you need to give the aesthetics of the chart. So it's pretty much saying uh, this is another function where you give your x variable. So to me, the x variable is the time, because I'm interested in the time to follow up. And the fill is going to be this status, but I'm going to leave as factor, because as you saw, it's, it gives me as numeric, but we know it's not numeric, it's a factor. So I'm just convertly on the, converting that on the fly as I do the chart. I'm gonna, so this is the basis of my chart, and to do a ggplot, you need, instead of a, a the ggplot pipe, is a plus sign. So I'm saying add to that the kind of chart that I want, that in this case is a histogram. I'm just beating him by 25. This 0.6 of alpha is kind of the opacity, because I want to be able to, because if I don't choose that, I wouldn't see what's behind, like we can see here, the shadowing of the censored. Kind of looks like more of as a purple 
with the red in front of it, it would just disappear and we would not see the censored values behind. So that's what the alpha value is there. The position is identity because it just means just put everything there. It's not, it's not I'm not going to stack. Stack would be censored on top of that or anything like that. Uh, scale fill manual, uh, manual, I'm just changing the colors. I'm saying that I want blue and red. So blue is censored, red is dead. And the labels, I'm saying what I want for those colors. And I'm just adding the uh, the labels for my, for my chart itself. So the X label is this and the Y is the count. So we can see here that we have a lot more dead people than censored. So a lot more people got the event of interest than we have of the censors. And we have here some censor people surviving over a thousand days, which could be maybe at the end of this study, I don't know, or lots of follow up. But the apparently from this chart, we can say that the the last people to die was between, I don't know, uh, 800, 900 and the 1000s, the little one next there, before the 1000. So this is a chart for follow-up time. So we can use this chart pretty much as uh, our, our exploratory data analysis. I recommend you to do more of this, to do it by groups as well. Uh, not just uh, by sensor and that, but maybe by gender, by age group as well. But for the example, we're going to uh, keep it here. And now we are going to understand how we actually do a Kaplan-Meier analysis in R. So the first thing to do is to use the serve function from survival. This function, what it does, it builds the standard survival object for, for you. So the most important parameters of this function are the time that represents the follow-up time for write sensor data. For interval data represents the start time of the interval, but as I said at the start, this is all about right sensor data. So it is going to be the follow-up time. That is exactly what our time variable represents already, because as we saw, is the survival time in days. We also have the event where usually, normally, you have zero as alive and one as dead. So zero would be our censored and one would be the uh, event of interest. In our case, pretty much is still the same, but now one is censored, two is dead. We're just adding one, but it's still on the same uh, order that the uh, that the, this function expects. Then we have time two that would be if you were dealing with it interval uh, data uh, sensor type of data, the time two would be the ending time of the interval for the sensor data. But again, we are not, we don't have that scenario, so we're not going to use that. And the last type, the last uh, main par parameter is the type of center uh, of censoring where the default is right. That is what we are dealing with. So we don't need to uh, mention that on the function when we call it. Uh, but you could use uh, right, left counting interval, interval two, MS state. You can all, uh, if you want to know more about these options, again, you can use question mark serve when you're in the R console and we'll give you, and it will lead you to the helper of the function. So, okay, if we see here, I did a, I'm calling the, uh, uh, I'm assigning the result of the serve function to a variable called km from Kaplan Meyer. I'm giving here the first event that expects is the time. So, this is what I'm giving time. And the second parameter is the event that is what we call in our data set status. I'm showing you here the head. So, the first 10 values of would this serve the standard survival object gives you. And you can see it's pretty much the uh, time with the event. So the event here is represented by a plus. If there is a plus in front of the time, after the time, 
uh, it means that that observation was censored. So out of these 10 first observations, we had two of them, the third and the sixth observations were a sensor. So this is all that it gives you. This is the standard survival object. So next, uh, we need to fit a survival curve, right? So we have those values and a couple of miles are supposed to be the step uh, curve. So we need to actually see that in R. And to do that, we can use the surf fit function. The surf fit functions create a survival curve. And uh, it, it's not considering any uh, different groups here. You need to uh, specify the intercept. The intercept in survive in this function serve fit. It's a one, so you just need to put the tilde one in the in the formula. We can model the survival. Uh, you can see that I'm adding model in quotes because uh, kaplan meyer is not an actual model. It's not modeling anything behind. It doesn't uh, expect any sort of model from the data. So uh, I'm just calling model in the sense of I'm going to apply a function here to my data. And we create uh, this object against this intercept. As again, we don't have any different groups at the moment, so the intercept is going to be just one. That means pretty much everything. Uh, we can do all those steps in one. So you can see here, um, I'm calling this KM fit for kaplan meyer fit. I'm using serving fit and I'm encapsulating the serve time status, but I've created that before, so I could just pass KM here would be the same but I like to encapsulate everything in one when I'm doing a survival analysis and then you can put instead of leaving the data here like this long and then getting the uh, the column uh, uh, selecting the column you can just you have on this surface you have the data parameter long so it's already going in this data and select the variables that have that uh, that name inside the data set I'm showing here a summary of this KM fit. Uh, and just one more thing before we talk about the summary. This looks a lot how we specify uh, models for linear models with the LM. Uh, you can see, so we have the tilde, and then in here we would have the, I don't know, uh, the X variables, and this would be the Y variable. So the Y is the survival object, and we also give the data, which uh, you probably seen it before. So going back to the summary, you can choose the times that you want to see. The time is just really the time that you... Uh, in years, uh, so it's gonna get the, the ones from the data. If it doesn't have that value on the data set, it's gonna give you, uh, as it's fitting something, right? It's fitting a curve, it can get the value for, uh, it can get the, uh, the value on the curve for any time you put in there, even if it's not really on the data set, it's what the function is estimating. So we have here that at time one, we had 228 people at risk, but no event. So the probability of survival was one. And then the probability of death is one minus the probability of survival, right? So it's zero. There's no probability of death at time one. But now at time 30, we had uh, 219 people at risk and 10 people had the event so 10 people die now the probability of surviving is 95.6 you can see that it also gives you the standard error and gives you the lower and upper 95% confidence interval you can change the confidence interval as well if you want you can ask for 19, 98 but 95 is the default and that's what you see when you get the summary of the KM fit. 
So as I mentioned to you before that I was going to show you a plot for the Kaplan Meier. So this is the plot we can see here. Uh, maybe it's more difficult to see since we have a lot of observations. But here towards the end you can see the step that uh, that it, it represents when an observation, uh, when a, a, an, an, an event happens. Uh, the crosses on the chart that you can see that some of the observation have crosses like the ones here at the end they represent censored uh, so anytime you see a couple of Maya function with those crosses they are representing censored information I'm plotting this chart using the ggserve plot function uh, it comes from that serve minor it, it integrates with the ggplot library so you need to have them both on your machine before using it uh, so this default uh, the default plot shows the step function the couple my function with the confidence bands that you can get from here but if you don't want you can remove the confidence interval and again the ticks or the crosses they represent the sensor uh, patients and they are shown by default but you can suppress that by uh, using the option sensor equals false uh, so I just showed you how to plot the survive curve using the GG serve plot but you can also plot uh, the curve by using the plot function from base R and you can do that just by doing plot with your Kaplan Meier fit within the brackets and then you're plotting that just like we do with the ggserv plot it just looks uh, nicer to use uh, this function from serf minor uh, you can also plot the Kaplan Meier curve upside down as this shows the probability of the event so it's going to show death or the event of interest instead of survival and we can do that by adding the option fun equals event in both ways of calculating this so both uh, in the base r plot function or in the ggserv plot so you can see here the difference of how those charts look especially when you compare the survival probability so this is one minus that the survival probability from the previous chart this is what i'm showing so uh one thing that we can do here with the charts is the estimating the x year survival so it's often of interest uh, for us when we are doing these types of analysis to understand what is the probability of surviving beyond a, cer a certain number of x years so for example we want to estimate what is the probability of surviving to one year so given that our lung data set the time variable is in years uh, tr then we are going to use 365 days we're going to assume that there's no leap years or anything like that a year has 365 days and you can see here that it's the same way it's using the summary function just like I did it here previously but previously I wanted four different uh, times so I used the concatenate function and I put it all the values that I was interested at inside that concatenate function so I was just saying get those four values for me in here as we want just one we just want to know the uh, estimate probability of surviving to one year I'm just gonna leave the 365 so we can see here in the result of the summary that for 365 we had 65 uh, observe we had 65 events and 121 people that were uh, at risk so the probability of surviving is 40 point it's 40.92 percent he also gives us here the standard errors and the confidence intervals uh, we have as well here the chart of how you're gonna see that uh, you can see that the 
what I'm doing is uh, I changed the scale of the chart here instead of living days now I left the month so the 12 months represented 365 days and you can see that that survival probability is where uh, to to find that by looking at the curve by look at the chart you can see where the 12 months uh, touches the curve and see where that reflects on the eye on the y-axis so you see here is a little below uh, the 50 percent so this is how we graphically see the uh, estimated probability of surviving x uh, years x days x time another uh, important metric that we can uh, often be interested at is the median survive time and we can obtain that directly from the surfeit object so we don't need to pass the number of days to the summary by just calling the km fit so just uh, typing that on the console you're going to see the call and you're going to see here that the median is 310 days for example and it also gives you the confidence intervals so the 95 percent lower confidence uh interval uh, bound is 285 and the 95 percent upper confidence level is the 363 days but the median survive time is 310 days and you can also determine that by looking at the chart very in a very similar way that we did for estimating the x year survival but now it's on the other way around so we know that the median represents 50 as the 0.5 survival probability so now what you can do is see where the y-axis touches the curve so where it crosses and then see how that reflects on the x-axis and we can see that's uh, uh, a little before the 12 months because it is 310 days so that's how you would graphically see the estimated median survival time uh, another thing that you can do uh, both graphically and with the functions is to compare the survive times bef between groups to do that we can use the log rank test that equally weights observations over the entire follow-up time and this is the most common way to compare survive times between groups it's very easy to get this log rank p-value from r you just use the function serve diff and uh, so you use it pretty much the same way you were doing the kaplan meier fit so but now you have this serve object and you have the tilde and we don't have the intercept anymore now we have the actual group that we want to compare that in this case is sex and you still pass the data set that you're using that it's long in our case so we can see the output of that function it does a chi-square test here so we have for example that males we had 138 uh, subjects and 90 female subjects the p-value is uh, smaller than the uh, standard 5% that we use and you can also see the chart here comparing those so you can see that uh, by doing the ggserve plot function the same one as before but now again instead of using intercept one we use the group that we are interested at i even add a p-value equal true which means that i want to display the v the p-value in the chart and it shows here the strata sex male as red and female as blue and this is how you would visually see the survival uh, times between groups and i mentioned the p-value that it's smaller than our standard five percent that means that we reject the no hypothesis so the difference between the groups is statistically significant so we can say that there is a difference in survival times between male and female so another thing that we can do so by uh, when we try to compare groups 
because uh, that is a very important thing we want to do in survival analysis, always be comparing against something, are there differences or not? And Kaplan-Meier curves are very good for visualizing differences in survival between two categorical groups, like here, female and male, they are categorical, they are factors. But it does not generalize well for assessing the effects of quantitative variables. And we might want to quantify the effect of a single variable or more than one variable uh, into a regression model and account for the effect of multiple variables. And that's what Cox regression comes in. Uh, Cox regression models can be used to fit un uh, univariable and multivariable regression models that have a survival outcome. So this is the formula here for Cox regression, just recapping as well this part before we actually see how it's done in R. And the HT function is the hazard function and the H0 is the baseline hazard. So the Cox model here relies on the assumption of proportional hazards. So that means that the hazard ratio is going to be uh, assumed to be constant over time for each covariant, for each group, even though the hazards might vary. So for example, the hazards for males and females, they could change over time, like here, see, they could change over time, but their ratio, the actual hazard ratio between them, stays the same. So that is the assumption of Cox regression models. Okay, so how do we apply that in R? We're going to continue with the long data set that we've been working so far. And to fit uh, regression models using uh, Cox regression, we can use the Cox pH function also from the survival package. And again, it's going to require a serve object. So you see, it's pretty similar to what we are doing before with the Cox, uh, with the Kaplan-Meier, but now we only change the function. Now it's Cox pH. We still have that uh, formula that receives the uh, survival object and then the tilde, and after the tilde, the group that we want to compare, so in our case, sex. The data that we're using is lung, and we're just going to see the results in a tidy way, so very clean, just read the result without all the verbos that a uh, summary can give you. So that's why I'm using the broom package with the tidy function, really, to clean the output. And we can see here that uh, the, the, for the sex female, we have the estimate of the Cox regression model, that is uh, minus 531. Uh, we have here the standard error, the statistics, and the p-value. And you can see the p-value is uh, 00149 when we were using the, uh, the Kaplan-Meier, it was 13, so it's not that far away. Uh, but again, the hazard ratio can account for more things, more variables than just a couple of my. So just understanding a little bit more of this R output, uh, the quantity of, of interest for a Cox regression model is the hazard ratio, the HR, and uh, it's represented by the ratio of hazards between two groups at any particular point in time. We can interpret that as the instantaneous rate of occurrence of the event of interest and those who are still at risk for the event. So as any ratio, a ratio of uh, less than one indicates reduced hazard of death or of the event of interest and where's a uh, a hazard ratio of higher than one indicates an increased hazard of death or event of interest. So from this output in R, we have that the hazard ratio, that's what uh, is going to be the exponential 
of the estimates we have here. C is the exponential value and uh, of this estimated here. What R gives me is this part here of the equation, is the actual, uh, and so we need to exponentiate that so we can see the hazard rate uh, ratio. So the hazard ratio is going to be 0 0.588, which implicates that at any point in time, females, since C uh, is giving you that by females, so it's saying that females have 0.588 times the risk of dying as males. So in other terms, females are about 40% less likely to die than males because it's less than one. So it is a reduced hazard. This is almost 60. That's why I'm saying about 40% less likely to die than males. Okay, so we apply the function. We know that females are uh, less likely to die than males for about 40%. But can I apply Cox regression? Because if you remember when we were recapping, we said that the Cox model relies on the assumption of proportional hazards. So in theory, we can only apply this model if we check the assumption and if it's uh, the assumption is uh, it's correct, it's right. If we don't check for that or if it does not uh, comply to this assumption, then we cannot apply this model. So what we are going to do is to check that assumption and we can do that in R as well. And it's pretty easy to do that. We can uh, test for the proportional hazards assumption by using the function Cox dot Z P H. So you can see here, right, the pH proportional hazards, and it's also from the survival package. So what we need to pass to this function is the Cox regression fit. Uh, we can check here the uh, by sex and global and from the output above here, from this output, the test is not statistically significant using an alpha a confidence level of 5% for the covariates and also for the global test. As our p-value is greater than the 5%, we can uh, assume the proportional hazard so we are okay in applying the Cox regression model. So this result here is okay. Uh, so this is how you were going to do an analysis, a survival analysis from uh, using R, so uh, using uh, a baseline, uh, so no groups, no comparison between groups, just a general idea of the survival, and also with the groups that you might want to study the differences and check, and most importantly, check if those differences are statistically significant or not. But Something else that you might want to do is do a multivariate analysis. So we're still going to keep the long data set because we have more variables there that we can use. So for this example, we're going to use age, sex, and echo status, uh, and the amount of weight loss as covariates. So now we have four covariates, right? So sex. We know we've been looking at sex as a factor with two categories. ECOG status is a factor with six categories. Uh, when we have three or more categories, we should choose one level to be the reference level that will define the hazard ratio of one. Because uh, so if we had male, the, uh, the probability of male dying against males is one. So that's why we mean by reference level. We also need a reference. We always need a reference level. If you don't choose, R will automatically pick one to be the reference. And for n levels, there will always be n minus 1 variables being represented when I'm comparing just like here. We only see female, we don't see the male, so it's n minus 1. We have two sex, uh, male or female, but we only see one. 
Uh, to do the uh, multivariate analysis, we use the function analyze multivariate. And now we change the package. We go to survival analysis package. package. So using the long data set, just so you see a little bit, uh, I'm using here survival analysis and this other library, tidy td bits. Uh, what we do here is long. So this is the data, right? Then we are going to do analyze multivariate. We're going to give here the variables that we're going to use, kind of pretty much representing the uh, our serve object, but now we don't have that serve object anymore. And the variables that we need to select are always the time and the status, the censoring status. Uh, so that's why we're selecting time and status. And now we select the covariance that we want to use by also selecting those variables inside the vars, with vars does is pick up the variables that have those names. So we want age, sex, the pH, ECOG, and the weight loss. Uh, so I'm seeing here the feet, uh, it has uh, it has this option here to see as a data frame already, the summary, which is nice because it's a more compact uh, summary. So like we uh, we can see here, sex is always showing, uh, I, I wrote six, but actually has four factors, sorry. So we can see here that uh, one, two, three. Uh, the six female, uh, it's using female again, so male is the reference. Uh, weight loss, we have age, but weight loss and age are both continuous so we, this function here already gives you the hr so you can see here that it's 558 the same number that we calculated here uh, with exponential so when using this function this analyze multivariate you don't need to exponentiate because we don't have the estimate we already have the hazard ratio showing here so uh, this three here, they all have one in there. Uh, no, they don't. Uh, the, so where is the confidence interval? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, they do. So these three val these two values here, they have one in the confidence interval. So they are not going to be considered uh, uh, statistically significantly. But we can also look at the p-value here. We can see that this p-value is... Uh, more than the five percent so they are indeed not statistically significantly but you can also see if the one is within the confidence interval uh, for the other ones uh, all of them seem to be statistically significant the differences of the uh, of the groups uh, another way that we can see that results is by showing uh, the confidence intervals plotted already. You can use a function called forest plot. Also from survival analysis, you can pass that uh, multivar fit. That's the name that we gave here for the multivariate analysis. We can order by HR. So it's going to order in an ascending level. So you can see here, see 0 0.56, 0 0.99. And we can see the breaks of the HRs, but we cannot see here in the picture. But anyway, you can see the p-value and it already gives you the a visual indicate if that uh, grouping is going to be statistically significant or not. So like sex female, uh, the confidence interval, it's here, it's not getting the, like I was saying, the one is not within and then it's significant. But when the one is in the interval, it means that it's not significant. And we can see here by the p-value as well, just like the table, but in a visual way. Uh, so now uh, that we did that, we need to do also a likelihood test to understand uh, what variables do we need to keep? Uh, what, do we, uh, what do we need from this model to get more uh, ideas from our model? Uh, to get the significance of our model here. And we can do this likelihood test by using the function drop1. And uh, this function is from base r. And uh, 
just to explain again, the likelihood test is to assess the goodness of fit. And uh, for we need to remove NAs, so we cannot have NAs, we cannot cope with that. And we can use that by using, we can remove the NAs by using the function NA omit. So you can see here on the data, I am removing them on the fly. And you can uh, update the results because, of course, we did the multivari variable fit, the multivariate fit using the data with the NAs. But now we want to remove that. So we need to update our model by when we can do that with the update function. And then you can see that I'm doing the test with the drop one using test chi square. That's the uh, and uh, we can see here the results. If you put the assigned variable in quotes, just like I'm doing here, it already prints you the result without you having to uh, retype the variable to see what is within it. It's going to print it by itself. So when we do that, uh, we can see here the uh, results of the likelihood test. And, and from this, the result of this likelihood test, we can see which variables are considered to be important or not, or which variables we can drop. We can see here that the only ones that we think are important are sex and the pH ECOG that gives us the same conclusion as the wall test. So you might be wondering what is the wall test? Wall test is what is being doing here to understand what variables are important because we are also telling you that with this view, right? It is analyzed multivariate. It's giving you the p-values that tells you which groups are, are statistically significant and they use wall test for that. Uh, but you can do that with the uh, sorry with the likelihood test that it's more robust than the wall test, uh, especially when you don't have a big sample size. But uh, the the greater the sample size, the more in, uh, I guess in, in line the conclusions are gonna be. But still, with st the both of the tests that we run says that the only variables are important are sex and pH cog. You can see here as well, sex, uh, it gives you this uh, P value and pH cog are these ones here, but in here it's separated per level as well. So you can also see which levels are important or maybe some of them aren't, but the results are the same, which is good, which confirms everything. So we, uh, and then what we can do is also check the concordance statistics. That's another important metric that we have when doing this type of analysis. And this statistic is used to assess the ability of a risk factor to predict the outcome. So given the probability of a randomly select patient who experienced the event, who experienced an event had a higher risk score than a patient who had ex not experienced the uh, the event. So you're kind of comparing, right, the people, that, uh, a patient that had the risk, that had the event with someone that did not have the event. And then this way, it kind of helps us understand the accuracy of the model. Uh, it ranges from half so that would be a poor model, that would be a random guess, uh, to one, which would be a perfect fit. So we can see here that our model has a concordancy of 0 0.65, 64.71, and we also have the standard error. So it's not an amazing model, it's not the best one. There are definitely things to consider, things to improve, but uh, it's also uh, better it's also but it is above half which would be the worst case possible but again there are things to improve here so I hope this has given you the ways of understanding how to do a survival analysis in R with both single and multivariate uh, analysis that you might need 
and uh, I'm leaving here some references that I used to help me create this slide. So I use this Applied Survival Analysis using R, which is a very good book with a lot of examples using R, as the name suggests. And also the Survival Analysis a Self-Learning Text, which is also very good to understand a little bit more of the uh, Survival Analysis theory behind. And thank you so much for your time and for listening. And again, I hope you've enjoyed this lesson. Bye-bye.